Good morning, church. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Ruth watched me grow from a young boy to a slightly bigger boy. La. Maybe not a young man yet. So give me a few moments to adjust to the view. I was joking with my father. Usually I'm standing back there and he will be standing in front. But today the roles are reversed. Yeah, before I begin proper, I'd just like to quickly thank the worship core team and of course SP and the Elders Board for extending this opportunity and this invitation for me to share with everyone on my thoughts and reflections on worship during this week's, uh, this year's worship weekend. Yeah, before we begin, shall we pray? Father God, I just want to thank you for this time that we can, as a congregation, enter into your courts with praise and worship. And Father, we never want to take it for granted that by your blood, we can enter into your courts to worship you. And Father, I pray that even as this morning I share, may you anoint me and hide me behind your cross, Father, that my words will not be my own thinking, but it will come from you. And Father, I pray that you help all of us come away from this morning with a greater appreciation and understanding of what worship is. So I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, for a little context, some background on myself. Uh, I've been serving in the worship ministry for close to 10 years now. Uh, I'm 25, so since I was about 15, 16. And this morning, uh, I would like to share a little bit on my reflections uh, over the ten, past 10 years, what I've learned about worship. And more specifically, really, I, I wanted to share this morning on the meaning and role of music and song in, relation, in our relationship with God and how we worship Him. Of course, as a young man growing up in this church for the past, I think, 20, no, 18 years, right? I've always come to church and there's always songs, you know. And growing up, I take it for granted. You come to church, we sing songs. But sometimes I find myself asking, what? Why are we doing this? What is worship? And really the central question is, what is worship? What does it mean to worship? Well, as I said, I've grown up in this church and I've also gone through many worship weekends for the past 10 years, right? And during our worship weekends, we always hear wonderful sermons by Elder, J Elder James, Pastor Susan and others in the worship core team about what worship is, the answer to this question. Well, and they've always told us worship involves sacrifice. Worship involves our entire lives. You can turn to the Bible to read this in Romans as Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, well, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You know, as Paul writes, so have our worship pastor and elders exhorted us as a corporate body, as a church, to not just view worship as songs and music, but to embody worship with our entire lives. So this is true, this is right, and this is biblical. That is the answer we usually come away with. You know, in fact, I was a little bit more curious, so I went to Google. What is biblical worship? And I got this answer. If you Google, you will end up with the same answer. Uh, it's lifted from the C.S. Lewis Institute. I'll read it for you this morning. Worship means respectful devotion, loving, honouring and obeying someone who deserves our highest regard. Worshipping God means acknowledging and celebrating His power and perfection in gratitude. Worship includes understanding and awe of God's holiness. We remember how great He is and we behave reverently in His presence. What a fantastic, comprehensive and biblical explanation as to what worship is. But, but you see, I, I noticed a funny thing. Maybe it's my, my, my youthful curiosity, but I wasn't quite satisfied with this answer. Because while this answer is fantastic, it doesn't mention one thing. The music. What are we doing? You know? Does that mean that the instruments, the music, the singing that we just did, that's not worship? Of course not. Surely not, right? What we did just now from 11.15 to 11.45, what was that? What was the scriptural basis for the music and the songs that we just worshipped God with? So what exactly are we doing when the drums build up so high and the guitar plays so nicely and the singers sound so fantastic? That really is the central theme and question of my sharing this morning. What is the role of music and song in our worship of God? 
Why is it so important to LSBC? And indeed, why is it so important to the universal body of believers, the entire church, since the very beginning? So I hope that by exploring this topic, we will all come away this morning with a greater appreciation and understanding as to why we worship the way we do every Sunday morning and exactly what is happening when we sing and when we partake in worship together as a church. So that's my outline for today. Let's just jump right in. So my first point, music and creation. I am a second generation Christian and I am the son of a worship leader. Okay, I was raised from birth, surrounded by music, mostly worship music. In the car, I remember as a young kid, I would sing along to very old songs like, Our God is an awesome God, He reigns. And in fact, my mother would often tell stories of how at our previous church, uh, while she, when she led worship, while me and my sister were still babies, she would park us backstage in the green room and then in between services or in between songs, she would rush to the backstage and quickly feed us. And after that, she'll come back out to lead worship for the closing song. You know, she always jokes, that's how me and my sister learn to eat so fast. Uh, if you are friends with us, me and my sister, if you have eaten with us, you will know that this is true. Okay. So funnily enough, uh, my mother thought that I was tone deaf for a very long time growing up. I remember she lamented with my father. She was like, how did we produce a son who has no inclination for music whatsoever? You know, she always prayed Joshua 24, 15 over my family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I think she had resigned herself to having her son serve the Lord in other capacities. Maybe in melting pot, considering my love for the chicken wings. Well, fortunately or unfortunately for her, I discovered my love for music after our youth church hosted a talent competition like 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. Uh, it was called Evoke Your Dreams. So I was very inspired after I saw people my age, around 14 years old, playing instruments, performing on stage. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I also realized that at 14 years old, my main interests were, and probably my only interests were playing computer games. And that wasn't going to work out when my cells mixed when I turned 15 and I had to talk to girls. So I picked up the guitar and I started learning. And thank God, my mother's prayers were answered. Years later, we can serve together as a family in the worship team. Music, therefore, has always had a special place in my heart. And not just because I met my girlfriend in my music club in university. Again, in my youthful, uh, maybe irritating curiosity, I often found myself asking the question, what even is music? What am I doing when I play my guitar? So I asked my science teacher, and my science teacher told me that hey, actually music is just the vibration of air molecules. You know, sound waves that vibrate at the right ratios and frequencies. That's all music is. Again, I found this explanation to be rather unsatisfactory because why is it that some combination of vibrations of air and frequencies of molecules could make me tear up? could make me experience happiness, could make me experience joy, nostalgia, longing, even peace. You know, it, it seemed to me that music had some special property differentiating it from just random noise. Although sometimes construction noise can also make me cry in the morning. You know, it, it seemed to me la, that the music had this special property that allowed it to interact with my emotions and even with my soul. Well, we find this idea in the Bible, right? If we turn to Samuel 16, we can see that when David played his harp for Saul, the king would feel relieved and become well, and that the evil spirit tormenting him would leave. So it seems that even biblically, we see this idea that music can interact with our emotions and even with the unseen spiritual realm. This morning, I would like to submit for everyone's consideration that Music has special properties because it is one of God's special creations. It is special to God. We read the Bible in the Old and the New Testament. We can see that music was present at the moment when God created the universe. Turning to Job 38, 4-7. And music will also be present in the throne room of God when He comes in glory to judge all of creation. We see this in Revelations. Chapter 14, verse 2 to 3. So music is special to God. 
And just like how God created colour and uses it for his own glory, God also created music. And he imbued it with this special ability to interface and to interact with our human souls and our very human beings. Music can stir our souls, it can stir our emotions, and it is even a way through which we can engage with the unseen spiritual realm. And friends, this is why, of course, Paul commands repeatedly that the church, with capital C, all churches include music, songs, psalms, spiritual hymns, all forms of music in our services and in our gatherings. And it is why even today, you know, thousands of years later, in all churches across the world, no matter what denomination, what tradition, what country you find yourself in, all churches include some kind of music in their liturgies and in their services. So that's why we have music in church and why it's so special. But I think we can press in a little further and so I, I, pre I did press in more. Okay. I'm going to read for you two passages of scripture. Uh, Ephesians 5.19 speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next passage will be Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. These two verses are usually the most often cited when we talk about worship in the church. And we can see from them that Paul does not merely command us to include music, but songs. What's the difference? Well, songs are pieces of music that have words or lyrics attached to them. You know, you might be thinking, oh Marcus, why are you being so now to make this distinction? Right. Well, just like how David playing the harp alone had the power to soothe Saul and drive out evil spirits, Music alone, with no words and no singing, already possesses the capacity to affect us, to affect our emotions. It is why we have such powerful, iconic moments in worship, even in the songs we sing today. Songs like What a Beautiful Name or The Stand. The bridges of those songs have instrumental breaks, there's no singing, but even then we can feel the presence of God and it stirs our emotions. The music alone is enough to draw us near to God, but Paul is specific in Scripture in commanding us that we sing songs, not just listen to good music. So why is he so specific? I will spend the rest of my sharing dealing with why I think this is the case. So I believe there are several reasons. The first, the reason why Paul commands the church to sing songs is simply that they are the best and most effective way to teach the body of Christ. In Colossians 3, Paul emphasizes that teaching and admonishing one another goes hand in hand with the singing of songs in church. And I believe that this is as much practical as it is spiritual. You know, I love this quote that I came across on a blog that reviews Christian songs for their theological accuracy. And the quote goes, Songs are the first and most memorable sermons that every Christian will listen to every week. This is true, isn't it? How many of us can remember a sermon verbatim, word for word? Like what DSP preached last week. You can't. Well, maybe some people can. I can't. Lah. But how many of us can remember a song word for word? If I asked you to sing Amazing Grace right now without the lyrics, can you sing it? Of course you can. There's a reason why we teach our children their ABCs with song. It is because it is the most simple and effective way through which we internalize and retain information. We do, we do it so well that now, in fact, even now I'm 25 years old, if you ask me what letter comes after I in the alphabet, I couldn't tell you. I have to sing the song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Ah, right? So songs that we sing in church are not just for us to draw near to God emotionally and spiritually. But in fact, they serve a critically important function in teaching us right and proper theology about God. It is for this reason that our church is so strict and so stringent about the songs that we get to sing and lead over the pulpit. I would know. Okay? There are many such cases of songs with theologically questionable lyrics that the worship core team has reject rejected from being sung in our services. 
So a classic example of this would be the song Reckless Love by Corey Asbury. You know, back when it came out in 2017, when it was released, it was one of the most popular Christian songs in the world. Churches all around the world were singing it. But our church didn't. We steadfastly refused to lead it. Why? Well, it's very simple because nowhere in the Bible is God's love described as reckless. It's not. It's simply not. There are many words that God's love is described as, but reckless is not one of them. So our church did not lead it. You know, as much as there are certain songs that have uh, uh, slightly more questionable theology, there are also many songs with wonderful, complete, robust theology that tell the entire story of the gospel. Just like the song we sang just now at the end of uh, the first segment of worship. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. You know, when you read the lyrics of the song, right, it's as if if you washed up on an island and you didn't have a Bible, but you wanted to evangelize to someone. You could just sing them the song and it would tell the whole story of the gospel. The songs that we sing in church shape and influence our understanding of who God is. So a church with poor or incomplete theology in the lyrics of their songs will inevitably create a church, a congregation with poor and incomplete theology in their own relationships with God, no matter how fantastic or how much money they spend on the worship setup. Okay? But don't worry, our church is very, very careful. The worship core team is always scrutinizing and ensuring that each song that is sung in church is biblically correct and useful for the teaching of the congregation. So that's our first reason as to why Paul commands the church to sing songs and why indeed we should sing songs. They teach us about God. Well, the second reason I believe that we should sing songs in church is that they are a unique and special way to interact with God. One of my favorite quotes about songs and songwritings that I've come across in my time as a musician is this, that words make you think, music makes you feel, but songs make you feel thoughts. I apologize to SP. This quote is from a non-Christian poet, but I thought it captured the point that I was trying to bring across quite well. You see, when, when we sing a song, when we engage in worship with a song, right, the music of a song, as we discussed just now, engages our emotions and our spirit. The words and the lyrics that we sing engage our minds and our thoughts because we have to think about what we sing. Well, some of my youth don't think, but that's how it is. Right? And of course, when we sing, when we use our bodies, we exhale the breath out of our lungs to sing, we are engaging our bodies. When we worship God with song, we are uniquely engaging every part of our human being. Body, soul, emotions, spirit, and mind. There is not much else that we can do in, on this earth that does so. I think additionally, Singing is also special in that it is a group, communal activity that everyone can partake in, that we can do together as a corporate body, joining our efforts as one to give praise and glory to God. Pastor Susan has always emphasized to the worship team that our church is a singing church. We are not a church with a great band. We are not a church with a fantastic worship team. But no, we are a singing church. And I'm glad this is really the case. You know, I can't tell you how many times during worship when I'm playing bass, and there's a particular moment in worship when the congregation sings so loudly and I, take out, I just take out my, my earpieces just to listen and to worship God together with the congregation. It's a wonderful feeling. So that's the second reason why. Singing is special. It's unique. There's not much else that we can do. Well, the third reason I'm coming to near the end, the close of my sharing, and this, this reason really is, in, in my opinion, the most beautiful. Uh, and it's the one that I'm most convicted by. Why the church sings is that our God is a singing God. God sings. We can read in Scripture, Zephaniah 3, it says, that, it says of God that He will take delight in you with gladness. With His love, He will calm your fears. And He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. So scripture establishes right from the very beginning in the Old Testament that our God, you know, the almighty God, creator of the universe, he rejoices over his creation with singing and song. I think it is only right then that we return the favor and we worship him with song. 
Can you imagine what it will be like the day we are glorified and we go to heaven and we can hear the songs that God the Father sings? Unimaginable songs that will surpass all our earthly imagination. I, I cannot wait for that day. La. I really cannot wait to hear God sing. But friends, it, it is not just that the almighty God who is the unseen creator sings over his creation. Did you know that Jesus, the Word made flesh, he sang on his time in earth. It's a strange thing for me to consider as well, you know. You know, usually when I picture Jesus, I picture him as a recipient of praise and worship, someone worthy of our praise. But Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, he also sang during his time on earth. So we can infer this perfect partly from the fact that he was a devoutly religious Jew, Jesus, and he would have been constantly engaged in worship in the synagogues. He would have learned all of the Psalms by heart, and, well, they were songs. But friends, we, we do not need to simply infer that Jesus sang, because the New Testament has an explicit account of him singing. It can be found in both Matthew and Mark's parallel accounts of the Last Supper. You know, in Matthew 26, of course, there's that famous verse which we just heard just now when we took our communion, where Jesus talks about his blood and the new covenant. But immediately following that, in verse 30, the account reads, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Mark's account of the same uh, incident is exactly the same, word for word. Who is this they? Who is they when they say they sung a hymn? Well, it's Jesus and his disciples. They sang a hymn. You know what's even more amazing, church? And when I was doing my, my research, of course, in my own quiet time, this, this blew my mind when I found out that we likely have the song that Jesus sang with his disciples. Did you know that? You see, because Jewish tradition and scholarship that dates the New Testament has agreed that Psalms 113 to 118 is likely to be the song sung at the end of the Passover. This collection of psalms known as the Hallel Prayer is one of the most precious passages in the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, to the Jews because it commemorates and gives thanks to God for his deliverance and salvation of the nation of Israel from their enemies. Okay, the Hallel Prayer is so important to the Jews. It is central to their celebration of Passover. It is sung at the end of the feast without fail every year. You can actually Google and you can go and find videos of Jews singing the Hallel prayer today. It is most likely, so both Bible scholars and Christian tradition agree that these psalms were the hymn that Jesus sang with his disciples after they had partaken of the Last Supper and just before he went to face his death on the cross. I, I would really like to challenge everyone to go and read these six psalms in our own quiet time, in our own time, together, collectively, because com combined, they really are a beautiful and moving passage of Scripture. But just for this, this, this afternoon, I, I would like to read for you the ending of Psalms 118. These were the last verses of the Hallel prayer and very likely the last song that Jesus sang on earth before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, reading Psalms 118, starting from verse 17, I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. Skipping ahead to verse 27, The Lord is God and He has made His light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. In some translations, it is to the sacrificial altar. Verse 28, You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. And of course, the last verse of the Hallel prayer, is, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, 
and his love endures forever. Church, this afternoon, I'd like, I'd like for you to imagine with me Jesus leading his disciples in this song. When he knew what the night ahead for him, the, what the night held for him ahead. Imagine him singing, I will not die but live. You know, to the disciples, to his dear friends, this would have been nothing out of the ordinary because they would have sung this song every year at Passover. They would have not thought anything of it. But to Jesus, who knew that he was going to go on the cross, imagine him singing, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. You know, church, many, many of these uh, psalms, the lyrics of these psalms are preserved to this day, and we include them in many of our songs that we sing every day in church, every week in church. Hopefully every day uh, in our own quiet time. You know, the, the, the line, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. We sing that joyfully in most of our songs. We include it in, in happy songs, right? But just imagine Jesus singing this before he went to the cross and the weight of that, what he bore. So friends, when, when we sing in church, when we sing praises to God, we are partaking in the life of our Saviour. We are doing something that He did. We are singing words that He sang. And I believe that as He led His disciples in praising and giving thanks to God, I believe when He returns, He will lead His church in praise and worship to the Father. He will lead us all in time of glorious worship, endless time. And in return, the Father will sing glorious song that surpasses any earthly imagination. Well, I'd like to conclude by saying that worship has a very special place in, in my heart and in my relationship with God. Uh, I was, as I said, I'm a second generation Christian, but God only became real to me, became my God that I took ownership of my faith when I was about 16. And what happened was me and some friends, some youth, uh, some of them might be here, uh, Jermaine, Isaac, a few of us, we were hanging out in, 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 in the, the chapel, the old chapel that's now gone, right? And we were like, hey, let's just play some music, uh, let's bring guitar and sing song, jam la jam, right? And that night as we were just playing worship songs, because those were the, mostly the only songs we knew how to play, right? We were worshipping God and the Spirit of God fell on us, you know, it was... That I've never experienced or anything up to that point. La. I had seen it before during church camp, during youth camp, you see these things happen. But to me, God coming so powerfully during a time of worship where we didn't have much to offer. We only had guitar. We could barely sing, could barely play. But God came and we all encountered and my friend started crying and I was like, what's wrong with you? Oh, then I felt it and I started crying and I was like, oh my goodness. So worship has always had a special place in my walk with God. And I believe that when we worship, the manifest presence of God draws near to us. And we can encounter him as well. So friends, we are going to go into another time of extended worship where the music that is played will stir our souls, minister to our spirit men, and it will heighten our sensitivity to the moving of the Holy Spirit. We will sing songs where the lyrics declare truth about God and offer him the adoration and the worship that he is due. And I believe that when we are doing so, as a church, as a corporate body, God will be amongst us, in our midst. He will be singing his own songs, taking great delight, and rejoicing over us. What a wonderful thing. So shall we rise? Shall we enter another time of worship?